it's like when we when we talk about items such as stock plants, they're considered mother plants. A cutting is known as a clone. Um, biologicals are known as bugs. Fertilizer, sometimes called newts or salts. So we just want to be able to let you know there is a specific language for the cannabis industry. And on the right hand side, that is the bad boy of this industry, a male flowering plant. Um, that's one item you do not want on your farm. So in order to do cannabis, there's a few different ways we can initiate the way to start. We can start from feminized seeds or seedlings. We can create stock plant and take cuttings or clones. And then there's a period of time where we veg the plant to get the growth of the plant up to the size we would like. And then there's usually a flowering period that takes eight to 10 weeks. So when you're trying to figure out which type of production you want to do, it's really the end product. Are you in the business of selling cuttings, clones, or teens to people? Do you want to do stock plant production? Or are you strictly going for flower? And even in the flowering market, are you angling all your product for dried material to sell into the market or going straight to extraction? And there is also the ability this day and age of auto flowers where the plants automatically flower at, at a time period. All this has to be brought into consideration when you're growing cannabis. One of the big things Griffin likes to bring up is planning is key in this situation. So we kind of want to know ahead of time, what's your budget? What type of structures you've got? A big thing is your type of water quality and, and what is your final market that you're trying to grow for? All these factors come in play when we're trying to set up a grow operation. And the other big thing too is who is gonna be the actual grower on site? If it's gonna be yourself, it's great to be forward thinking. And if there's gonna be a grower hired, we always would like to see that grower brought in early because a lot of his decisions may change the outcome and how things are made. So when we're looking at all, all the processes we're gonna be talking about here today, um, we took, Griffin took a lot of things into consideration in the state of New York. One is your space limitations. Two is the regulations New York has on, your, on supplemental lighting. Um, requirements of growing the crop, climate in New York state and potential paths to marketing. So I've, we're gonna start right off in the, in the field, the reason being is it's actually the biggest canopy that you're allowed in New York state. Um, you've got roughly an acre. If you do um, indoor production, you only have around 6,250 square feet. So know your crop plan, um, even in the field, whether the plant is planted in early June or July is gonna change the overall size of the finished plant. Say if we planted a cutting or seedling in the ground in late July, we're gonna have a plant two to three feet tall. If we plant that mid-June, we might end up with a plant six to eight feet tall. So the spacing in the field would vary from, we could have five foot rows, two feet apart on a short plant to as big as six foot wide or eight foot wide rows, plants eight feet apart if they're six to eight feet tall. Um, you want a well-drained soil, there's no problem with doing a raised bed in the field or growing it in a pot or a container. Um, there has to be some type of irrigation system, whether it be drip or drip emitters. If you're growing in the ground, mulch film is nice because there isn't really a, any great spray application for weed control. And it also helps in moisture control in insects. And then we got to look at nutrients. Um, are we going to do it all through liquid feed or are we going to pre-apply some into the soil directly? So <laughs> we jump a little fast there, Mariana. So we had we had two pictures. We're going to back up. These are this is a field of in New York State. This is another picture showing plastic culture. We like plastic culture under the crop. Um, that holds the moisture and holds a spot between the drip tape and the plants 
to try to keep the drip tape or the drip emitters clean. Okay, jump to the next one, Marianne. This is a nice picture of a crop grown in New York State. Now, when we talk irrigation, the reason we like to go with drip irrigation um, to the crop is we do not want left wet, the leaf surfaces wet on the crop. Powdery mildew and molds and mildew, especially in the later part of the year, can wreak havoc to this crop. So we want to use some type of watering system in order to get it down for the plants. Now we're going to jump into different types of structures that we see would fit into the cannabis arena in New York. So again, we got to look at your, your square footage allotments. We feel in the field because of the, the climate in New York state tends to be damp and wet, especially in the latter part of the years, that there should be some type of over coverage on a field crop in order to get that quality that the customer is looking for. So we're talking high tunnels and cold frames. Um, they're simple ground to ground structures. And then if we get into more elaborate stuff like per more permanent ground to ground structures with heat and humidity control and fans and or gutter connects, then you've got to consider snow and wind loads based on town regulations. And the type and style of the crop you want to grow is always going to dictate these type of structures. So as I said before, if we are going for year round production and we want to control the climate really good, we're looking at nothing fancy, ground to grounds, gutter houses, double layer poly, but we got to make sure they're load bearing for snow loads. And then high tunnels, we're looking at lightweight portable structures. We're basically trying to put something over the crop so we can control the water levels on the crop. And, and then the coal frames was, were designed to do the same thing as a high tunnel. It's just they're more permanent. They're not movable like a high tunnel structure. Here's a great picture of a Arnois high tunnel structure. It's, it's a simple ground to ground. Um, the poly comes off in the winter time. Here's another picture of it. They have rolling up side walls um, and they can be very large in, in size that you can get right inside with a tractor and do moving around. What we like to see is on the side wall, as you can see in both pictures, is you want something at least with a six foot height side wall because you wanna be able to grow that crop right out to the edge of the structure. You wanna go a little bit more permanent but still be considered just a covering for the structure in the outside world. So there's no heat, no fans, no nothing. Then we go to a cold frame. Um, this has the ability to slide open the end walls or roll up the side walls and gives that ability to keep the moisture level off the crop or rain and stuff late in the, late in the seasons when the plants are heavily budded. Now when we go to greenhouse, indoor production, we're looking to cycle basically every 12 to 13 weeks. And so we have a two week, two to three week period, 21 days where we root cuttings off of whether they're brought in or off of mother stock. A one to two week period where we veg, some guys might even veg up to three weeks. And then there's an eight to 10 week flowering period. Now this is usually done in a staggered approach so that we don't have to have huge inputs. So, um, and, and we'll show you a little later on, we have like a dedicated greenhouse, each staggering for a flower cycle. So you're not trying to harvest all at the time, but basically doing perpetual harvests so you have stock and inventory. As I said before, in New York State, we feel one of the Griffin fields, one of the great ways to go is just a simple ground to ground pipe frame greenhouse. The big thing we want to Emphasize would be the sidewall height of at least six foot and that the structure could take snow and wind if it, you're gonna operate it through the time of the year when those are around. Um, and if you're planning on down the road adding lights or any type of blackout curtain systems, that has to be a consideration up front that the structure can handle that with a truss design. 
Another great picture of a ground to ground. And, and if you look at this crop right now, I'd like to point out, um, this is photo period lighting. So it's just simple bulbs spaced out so far down through the greenhouse in order to trick that plant to stay vegetatively growing. Now, if you're going more around the year and you wanna get what I would call more of a high end or you have available to you a gutter connected greenhouse, gutter frames are very good. They're very versatile. Um, as you can see in the picture here, they can add a, a blackout curtain system so we can control sunlight levels on the crop, shade systems. They support the lights and the fan packages. And then in the end walls, we can create a lot of airflow movement based on fans and intakes with even with wet walls for cooling. We also have the ability to retrofit existing structures. Uh, this was a rose range in Oklahoma that we converted out. Um, this is a new type of polycarbonate that's known as white, black, white. So the center of the polycarbonate is black, but it's white on the inside and the outside. So they reflect light, but no light can transmit through. And so this house was set up for, for mother stock. And then there was one identical of it done for clone. So the next area you want to look at when we're doing a full-time year-round system is we want to control the environment much more than, than just as far as covering, putting a cover over the plant. So we're going to show you some different ways of controlling the environment when you go indoors. There's several things we can do. We can manage the heat. We can manage the venting and the cooling in the building. We can add light deprivation. This plant when it's flowering, wants a 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. We can create curtain systems and stuff to, to get that situation. We'd like to add supplemental lighting because it's dark and this plant requires a high light level. So we want to be able to have lights so that if it's cloudy or rainy, we can turn the lights on or it's in dark part of the year so we can keep the crop growing on a schedule. And then there's a lot of options, you know, there is not a lot of options for insect control on this crop. So proper screening will help to keep the bad ones out and give us better control on that. Here's some pictures of some traditional horticultural style heating units. Um, to your far right is an affinity gas heater. Middle is, is one of the industry standards, uh, Seabrink oil-fired furnace. They also come in gas-fired. And to the left are the high energy efficient biotherm gas boilers that can do either heated fin tubes on the walls or we can actually heat the floors. Pretty much standard ventilation in all greenhouse structures are fans and intake louvers. We can add a pad system on the wall, which in the summertime will cool the structure as water passes down the pad. New to the industry out of lubing that just came out recently, this is plastic pad walling. So the old style was a paper pad. This is actually a plastic pad that goes in the end wall, works the same way, has twice the longevity. And when we're trying to do block out on the sidewalls where we don't want light coming in, it has the ability to block the light coming in. So it, you get more for the cost of just a wet wall. Now, if you seem to be running a little wet in the greenhouse and you can't seem to dry it out just by using um, air dumps or heating up the structure, there are ways to do de dehumidification by adding a piece of equipment that basically pulls moisture out of the air and turns it back in a liquid form and drains it back out. Um, these are Quest, Aiden, Dram, and Biotherm all have commercial mark models on the market. Um, they're basically sized by square footage and how many pints per day they can pull out. And you have to have an area where that drain off can go some people capture it back into tanks or others will put it right down the drain. So as I said before, we wanna to try to block the insects from coming into the building. Big problem when you put up insect screening is it restricts airflow. 
So we tend to try to build what we call uh, an outside structure outside the intake louvers, as you can see here in the picture. And it's got a few benefits. Um, this way here, we need about three times the amount of air coming into that intake louver in order to sat satisfy what the, the fans are, are pushing out the backside. And so it, it, this way we do it on a caged area outside the house gives us that kind of surface area. It gives us the ability to go inside if it gets dusty and dirty and blow it off and clean it off because at times of the year you will get buildup like this. And then in the winter months when we aren't really worried about insect pressures coming from the outside, we have the ability to take down that insect screening and let the air come in on its own and put that away. Okay, now I'm gonna look at a few of the lighting essentials. I will say that I'm only gonna touch on this briefly because in the upcoming webinars, this is an area where somebody, we're gonna go more in depth, okay? So I wanna explain photo period first. Photo period is the ability to trick the plant that it's a long day. So it's not trying to supplement and grow the plant. We're trying to trick it into an eight hour day. And then we have supplemental lighting where regardless of an 18 hour day or if we're growing the crop is where we're trying to add extra light to grow the crop itself. So as we've seen in the picture in the past, periodic lighting is simply as putting LED light bulbs based out every six feet over the crop that we can trick the plant in thinking of it's a long day. But if we're trying to physically grow the plant, then we're gonna use a supplemental lighting. And we're gonna show you a few examples of both. Now, if anybody's not familiar, um, it, when we talk to vegetative growth, that's when we're trying to bulk the plant up to get it to size. That's when it requires 18 hours. When we flip the plant to flowering stage, yes, it's still growing because, but it has initiated a flower set on the plant. At this time, we only want to have 12 hours of light. And so, or less, but ideally we want 12 hours. And so we can manipulate that 12 hours by blocking out the light and increasing the light when, when we need it using supplemental lighting. And there's several options here. We're gonna go through the options right now and show you in more detail. As I said, we're trying to block out light. So here's an option. This is a blackout curtain system that can be installed inside a hoop house. So we have, it gives the ability to go to an existing hoop house and build a blackout curtain that kind of stands on its own inside a hoop house. Now, if you don't want to go in that direction out of advancing alternatives, we can actually create a blackout system on top of the greenhouse on the outside. So this will roll up all the way to the peak of the house. And then when you need blackout, it can roll down over top of the house. Now, the other places you need to block out light is both in your intake louvers and through your fans and shutters. How we achieve this is we use this blackout material. It's basically woven steel that air can pass through, but light cannot transmit through the thing. So we actually build these, these blackout systems both in your fans and into your intake louvers. As I said before, when we're trying to veg a plant, we call that night interruption or vegetative growth it can be done simply with, with LED type 16 watt bulbs, maintain it roughly six feet apart. We showed it earlier on in that ground to ground hoop house, kind of like construction lights laid out down through the house. First, I'm gonna show you is HPS, HPS has come a long way. It's one of the industry standards. It was the first light that would give us the full spectrum of what the plant wanted um, and the intensity that the plant was looking for. It also gave us the benefit of throwing off extra heat. It was usually spaced in a greenhouse on, on what they call a 16 square foot pattern to the crop.
Lately in the industry, we have been moving more and more into LED technology for several reasons. LED technology, we can use it above the crop. We can lay it laterally down in the crop to add more light. Um, it's huge energy savings, and there's been a lot of rebates on LEDs. One thing we'd like to point out in the LED market is the light needs to be listed under DLC, what they call this design light custodian. And what it is, it's the efficiency of the LED. So the, it's basically the light's ability to convert electricity to watts efficiently. And if the, if the light cannot be over an efficiency of 2.0, and is certified by the DLC, no PAR company right now in the US will give you a rebate, buddy. So when you're looking for lights, that's kind of on the criteria if you're looking at rebates for the lights in your facility. Now let's go towards ways we're gonna do and feed the crop. We call it nutrient delivery systems or different types of irrigations to make your life easier for feeding this crop. So if you're not familiar with it, or if you are familiar with it, um, injectors are probably the easiest thing and most reliable ways to feed this crop. Um, we start with a stock solution. Usually it's a multi-head system. Um, there's several parts to your feed program. The way your feed program is usually figured out is we take a water test. Um, we like to see a horticultural water test and in Griffin, you have the ability to use our technical department, we call GGS Pro. They'll actually sit down with you and work with you to help write that fertilizer program if you're gonna go on a water soluble, um, whether it's JAX, ICL, um, plant products. And we will help you to write all the way from clone, all the way up to your finished flower program on a spreadsheet of how to feed that program and mix it going through each individual head. Here's another format of irrigate, um, irrigation, uh, fertigation system. This is a dosatron multi-head panel. And let's start, let's explain this a little bit to you on, on the call here. Um, so the, if the water would come in on the left-hand side. We wanna maintain a pressure usually between 40 and 60 pounds PSI. Um, 60 pounds is best. If it's not, you do not have a water source at, at that level, there are pumps nowadays that you can add in and dial that up so you have that added pressure. Um, so each one of these injectors has a different piece of, of your recipe, so to speak, of your feeding. One could be calcium, one could be a, you know, your other basic fertilizer needs. And what you do is the water flows through, you have the glass, the white glass jars mixes the material. When it comes out on the far end, you see a blue lab meter up at the top. When you're looking at the chart that we wrote through GGS Pro on your water formula, it would say you need to, when your fertilizer is mixed together, you're looking at an EC of 1.4, it would show on that. It would show your pH and your EC. And then you know you're running correctly. It can be alarmed so that if it's auto whack, it, it tells you that something's going wrong. And then it goes back through another pressure regulator. So you make sure you're not losing pressure. We like to see that again, somewhere between 45 and 60 pounds before it goes out to the zones to each and every one of your greenhouses or growing locations. So drip irrigation can water a plant much, much easier much faster and more accurate than a human being. We can actually put the precise amount of water you're looking for at every plant, every time. And we can also pulse water, which is known in the industry. So rather than pouring all the water at once at this crop, we can put half of it down and then put it two more times a day. So we keep the plant moist, not really getting it dry and not making a water line. And this can all be automated if you'd like. And there's a lot of options to the ways that we can drip this on. So there's drip rings, there's drip tapes. 
Um, there's spray stakes that go single side, double side. Um, there's weighted emitters. Um, we have spray stakes. Um, a lot of ways, we have four ways and eight ways. There's a lot of ways we can put this on to the crop. Depends on the way you want it. We look at ways to simply control it. Customers like technology. So um, we're lucky enough this day and age, we can take a simple rainbird, as you can see to the left, and that can have up to 48 functions. It can have a Wi-Fi card put in it so that you can talk to it and see what's going on onto your phone. And so we can trigger a zone based off a solenoid and have that do so many watering times a day. And then you can look at your phone and make sure that it actually did it. And they're so inexpensive. When we do these type of operations, we can actually put one controller to each basically greenhouse and break it up into multiple zones in the greenhouse. So if you have more than one variety, we can water each variety at its own level. And as I said, it is a cheap way to do this. Multiple zones, they are now cloud-based. So that information goes up in the cloud. You can look at it from anywhere and it's zoned out. So you can have multiple varieties all in the same location. If you wanna get a little bit more sophisticated, um, we get into Wadsworth Link 4 controllers. These controllers can monitor everything in the greenhouse. So I can do irrigation, the fans, the lights, all of it can be done, all of it can be data logged, all of it can be backed up, charted and graphed. We can tie it into weather stations so we can close up the environment. Um, the way we set these up and how we choose them is really when we sit down with you in the early stages, Think of every function in the greenhouse, whether we're turning a fan on and off, um, opening a curtain, turning on a light, those are all functions or light switch. And each one of these has so many light switches they can handle. And so based on all that different equipment, your light you're wanting to run, we will show you which models best fit the situation you're trying to build. Another area I wanna look at here today is some people might wanna grow just on the ground or in the field, but you do have the option of growing plants up on benching and different types of support systems. So benching can be helped to take an area and, and make it very efficient and also clean. Um, industry standard is ebb and flow trays. The reason they like that is so they have the ability to catch any drain or runoff water from the facility. Um, they also have the ability to roll back and forth. So we only have a single aisle. So we capture more of the can canopy square footage in a growing situation. Here's a couple pictures of ebb and of the ebb and flood benches. You can see that the, there's a trellis support that we can add right to the bench so that we can put the plastic trellis support to hold the buds up down through the crops. Um, most growers this day and age like to work with four or four and a half foot wide benches because it's easy for a person to reach in from side to side. We've kind of moved away from the traditional six foot that were originally used. When you're doing this too, of buying these type of benches, you wanna make sure that the bench actually can support the weight of the size container that you're looking to grow in. So if you're in say a three gallon or less or growing in some other type of media, that's kind of standard weight. But if you're trying to get bigger, we have to add more support so we don't break that plastic bench. And so as we sit here and look, you'll see the trellis system um, that trail system can be moved up and, up and down vertically on the crop. You can put trellis netting across at several levels, not just one, and it can fit both the four and six. Comes in rolls as wide as 10 foot wide, because we do have some customers that actually go across the bench and then laterally down on the sides to actually support the side, because the plant doesn't grow in a straight line up and down. The other thing I want to point out is 
Griffin is kind of A to Z as a company. So we can do everything from the pots, the containers, all different size um, types of media. We can do organic, water soluble. Um, we have cleaning products. And the biggest thing I want to say again is we have all our own in-house technical department that can help you with questions and answers all the way through this whole process. So, gave you a lot of options, a lot of ideas. I want to kind of pull it all together right now a little bit for New York and give you what Griffin feels our best ideas if we were going to be a producer in the state of New York. So the biggest thing that we always say is, is um, first is we want you to walk before you run. Okay, so let's let's start first in field production. Okay, more than likely you're going to start it with a seeded plant or a liner. Um, you're going to plant sometime between June and July. Um, and we're going to go through all the same things. It's got to be a sunny location. It's got to be well drained. Um, stay away from heavy clay soils. Think about the size of your plant. Um, drip tape doesn't put down the amount of water or a drip emitter does, you might have to put multiple drip tape. And you might consider of an outside production like a mum field where you grow it on a black lumide mat because you can keep them a little closer. There's less chance of weed problems and you pretty much can, tr can tr control everything going into that crop. So either way, we can help you here. And as we said, we would like to see the crop if it's planted in the field, multiple drip tapes. We like to see mulch so that you can control that. If it's in a pot, drip stakes, more than one drip stake per pot to get even water flow. Um, if it's planted in a field, it's kind of got a feeding schedule of uh, field corn, yet it needs extra calcium and magnesium at some point. Um, and if it's grown in pots or organically, um, you can do both. Uh, we usually ask that you incorporate some kind of top dress either in the pot or in the ground, and then we supplement with organic materials. One of the big things I'm going to stress, because there is a stress factor when you are outside, that somebody's going to have to walk that crap looking for hermaphrodites, which are female plants that try to throw flower and male plants. And I'm going to stress on the male plants because one male plant in that acre crop of, if we did the 44,000 square feet of growing, if you produce one male plant and he had the ability to flower, he could ruin the entire crop in that field. So to do liner production, whether it's rooting cuttings or seedlings, um, simple ground to ground st greenhouse structure, Griffin offers, these type of structures, give you an example, be star steeled. If we're going more into the colder weather types in depending on your town, you'll have to check with zoning. They may require stamped engineered plants for, for both wind and, and snow loads. Um, we'd like to see double layer poly, usually a clear poly on the, on the, out, on the top an IR film that stops dripping on the inside. There are cooling polys today known as solar cools, luminous that actually are a softer light in the summertime, kind of block the light in the summer and get more light in the winter to help in the cooling process. Um, you can do a little bit of lighting like I showed you with, with light bulbs, kind of like a string of lights for photo period. And then you have a lot of options in venting and cooling, whether it's Roll up sides, you can put ridge vents in, um, exhaust fans with louvers, and we have cooling pads, even with the new blackout one from Lubing. Heating system, as I said, usually we always say, what's the best fuel in your area? Um, if you're, gas, you're looking at propane or natural gas, there's the Infinities, the boilers, even the Sebrinks, and the Sebrinks are also available to fire with hot air. Um, big thing is heating becomes a tool in your greenhouse for humidity control. So it's always good to have a few extra to, to work on that as well. Benching, um, you can work on stationary benches or you can have rolling benches. 
injectors we use, the current ones in the industry, Anderson's, Dosatron's, Netafin and Link4, and irrigation systems. If you want one where you have a set of blueprints that somebody comes in, then we probably lean towards Dram because they have the capabilities of giving a, a nice pretty design like that. Or we have people in house in our irrigation department that can help you designing a system using Netafin and Seninger. If you're looking to do stock plants, um, it's a three to month process. You can start from seed. We would stress using feminized because if you bribe raw seed, 50% of that seed could be males. Um, takes about three months to grow up plants. People use sort through them to do what we call phenotyping. Um, you know, every plant doesn't grow the state. So they're looking for certain characteristics. They usually send it out to have it tested to make sure it's true to form as far as THC and, and all the properties that were claimed when you bought it. Um, and then you use them as, you keep them under high uh, long day light levels, 18 hours a day and use them for cutting material. Most plants usually produce 25 to 50 cuttings every 14 days as a good judge for using that stock. So this would be Griffin's best recommendation for a greenhouse project in New York State. Based on our research and looking at the rules and regulations in the state of New York, I'm gonna say this again, we feel you should learn this crop if you've never grown it before. Um, it is a, to Griffin, it is a crop, but it's a little different, unique. We kind of call it a cross between a poinsettia and a tomato. Um, we feel ground to ground greenhouses are the way to go. Um, there's no real reason unless you own a gutter house to build a gutter house because you want to isolate the crop and do it in crop rotations of 30 by 96 three times based on the footprint almost comes to your square footage and gives you three flowering areas and based on it you could have a, a head house where the mother stock the clone and veg material could do now if you want to if you have limited resources and limited money we could start with liner production um looking at new york state we could do a first crop in in a house like this using an auto flower um, if it was planted sometime in april it would be harvested in late June, you'd have time to clean the house, reset it, and come in with a second crop of your traditional style cannabis cuttings. They would naturally flower in late August and be harvested in September and October. This would eliminate you needing to spend money right out the gate on photo period lighting and or any blackout system. So you could produce two crops to make money to buy that type of equipment and lighting to add on later on. I, we will stress because of looking at the light levels in New York, we do feel there could be need for supplemental lighting in those in the later months of August, September, and October. So Griffin's year-round strategy, like I said, would be for that, that our oval textile greenhouse, three of them. Um, here's just an example of all the pieces, parts we would put into it. Same thing, here's your, your chances. One thing I would like to point out is that um, if you were looking to do CO2 supplement, that this day and age, we can do it off of your gas-fired boiler system. There's, there's systems that we can actually recapture the CO2 and put it into the rooms. Or a lot of people start early on with supplementing CO2 right off of bottled gas and then adding it down in under the crop in times of year when the crop needs more CO2. And then we have a lot of options, whether it's LED, HPS, or ceramic halide and lightings. And there's a lot of ways that we can create that light deprivation system, not only in curtain systems over the crops, but in your end walls and side walls and in your vents and louvers. Just to state again on your benching, we have rolling and stationary. We have bottom heat. If you wanna just heat the floor and, and grow right on the floor, we have the capabilities of doing that. 
um, different trellis support systems, a lot of ways to inject that fertilizer in to get it accurate on the crops, all different types of irrigation designs, depending on what size and container you want to grow in, and a lot of ways to control that environment, whether it be simple or complex. Just like to show you a little more sophisticated in a gutter house, how fancy they can be. And that's it, guys. We are definitely open for questions. Like to hear some. Um, I am showing you Scott Baker's name and email address and cell phone number. He is currently covering, he is your go-to lead in the New York State market. So if you wanna bring Griffin in on your conversations or would like the team from Griffin to start working with you, he would be the key person to reach out to in this group. And I'd like to say to everyone, if you do have a question, please use your chat function and we'll get. I don't mind if you open up your mic and ask guys. Sure. No, everybody's oh. quiet today, Mariana. I guess so. <laughs> shy. <laughs> They're shy. <laughs> I, I will say, guys, every in situation in New York State is going to be a little different. Um, Griffin is not scared to, to sit down with anybody. Um, we're, we, we don't cost anything to talk to you first out the gate. We have worked on this crop in a, almost every state in the United States in every type of situation, whether it's in the ground, in buildings, in greenhouses. So we have a lot of information and a lot of resources as a company that we can help you to get you going in the right direction right out the gate. Right, and if you're not familiar with Griffin CEA division, I invite you to visit our website and get on our mailing list. Um, the CEA division publishes a lot of informative tech tips that are free. Um, you just need to sign up to receive them. And there's also um, quite a bit of uh, video, uh, technical videos on our site, tech tips that you can look back in past issues and get information from there as well. So yes, Derek, I just saw you flashed in with my thoughts on 20 lights. Um, so New York made a mistake. They are forcing you to be outside growers. They want you to grow in the field. Um, so we feel reading over the regulations, that's why we feel a, a tunnel greenhouse outside. You know, they're being kind of unique. They're saying to you, you have 40,000 square feet of canopy. Is canopy just the road down through the field or is it the space in between? I look at it just the road down through the field. And I do not classify a high tunnel as a greenhouse nor a cold frame. I consider both of those just protecting structures. So we look at it as, you know, if you wanted to, that's why we look at the three 30 by 96s, because when you start putting the alleyways and stuff in there, we can light those three houses with lights. That's about the maximum square footage greenhouse we can get away. And that's basically considering ourselves three areas of flowering. A good question. We feel that's the first part that New York is probably going to change. I know there's a lot of pushback on that. Um, we're still having a hard time because we have some operations that own multiple licenses at a, at a site. So they stack them together to get more lights available. I should be able to. Mariana, can you un can you unmute Derek? Yep, just give me one second.
should be able to I think that worked. It did? Okay, good. Hey, Pete, how you doing? I'm good. Good. Um, yeah, I just uh, kind of wanted to get a little clarification on what you were talking about right there. So your thoughts are that we could put these high tunnel in and they're not going to declare that a greenhouse um, as far as for our limitations. No, I'm thinking that is to be able to it's call not it. A, it's not a heated structure. It is not a greenhouse. Right. It's, it's not thermally it, insulated. It, but it is. It is okay. just. It's just a protection. No different than shade clock uh, over a, a, a crop or something. It's sure. just yeah, a lightweight to, structure that that you know. You ultimately you you could put the framework up. If it was me, I'd put the framework up, work on it in the field. Do not even put the poly on till we start getting bud set. That's when you're going to have your challenges of worrying about molds and mildews is that, you know, late August, September and early October rains or frost. That's where you get all the problems. Yeah. I mean, we had snow October 6th last year. So, you know, we were dealing with that uh, situation, um, you know, with the late start to the season anyway. So. Um, I'm just curious on your thoughts about like the 20 lights and implementing that, you know, we just rolled through trying to talk to a bunch of different lighting companies and how to actually, you know, properly light a greenhouse with only 20 lights and none of them could come up with a, a good solution for us. I mean, especially with the sunlight here in New York, you know, so it's a struggle for us. Um, and then also I wanted to get a little clarification too about how you were talking about the perpetual growing where we were kind of under the impression that that was the state didn't want us to do it like that. They were limiting our canopy to only one cycle. Do you that, have any that, thoughts? That, I'm not, that, to be honest with you, I'm not sure of that, but I would say, you know, they limited you to so many lights. They yes, really right. limited you to your, you know, your growing, so to speak. Yeah, there's no indoor option to actually do, you know, how we would like to, you know, actually produce the product. Yeah. Um, everything kind of got pushed to the outdoor. And that was, you know, the choice that made the most seasonal sense because you're giving up so, so much square footage to try to move in, plus the additional cost of designing the greenhouses to work with that 20 light system. Yeah. You know, we look at, I, I always look at it that, that you know, if, if I was somebody they wanted to be an organic grower and because of the testing and stuff, the way the labs work and, and your microbials, if I was going to grow organic, it would be like in a raised pot outdoors or in the field where we can put down the inertial fertilizer and then supplement it. Right. That's I exactly thought. how we do it. Yep. Yep. And, and so that would be the way I would look at it. And then I probably would market it that way because there's very little organic material out there in the, in the cannabis world. It's just very hard to do. Sure. But I, I, I still feel based on our recommendations and the way we looked at it is if you had a, a three hoop house set up 30 by 96 is with a head house that you could basically set it up light cycle wise and, and grow enough indoors and that yes, you're going to, you're going to lose down to 20,000 square feet outside or you buy multiple licenses. I guess that's your best option. Yeah, I don't think they're going to let us do that at this point from the feedback that we've gotten. Okay. I mean, not with true party of interest, like it can't be anyone in our family or our organization, you know, we'd have to do like what you were talking about with some of the bigger situations like wheat field, there's multiple growers working together, you know, in one space. So they've allowed to kind of expand. Yeah, I think it's, I think by far, this is the biggest, you know, it was New York's way quite frankly, they were given licenses to hemp growers that were outside in the field and they wanted, they gave review a rec license and they've kind of wanted to keep you in the field. Right, that was what was hard for us because we were actually um, a hemp company that was growing indoors, you know, and then processing material from other outdoor growers. So they kind of put us in a situation where, okay, we are an indoor, you know, grow and now you're forcing us to outdoors. Um, so that that's been a bit of a challenge, but you know we're we're dealing with it. <laughs> so yeah, so I, 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 I would that. say I would say the best op you know the best option the way I looked at it is is you know where where I said that scenario where we take lights pretty much out. Um, the only place you kind of need a light if you wanted to stay indoors would be for you could rack your you could rack your uh, veg and and your clone in your mother and then just use that you know multi couple times a year 
coming kind of early and late in a, in a cold frame type structure or, and grow two crops. And you don't have a huge input cost. Right. Use an auto in the other and then just take the winter off and spend it extraction instead of trying to do a five season turn. Sure. That just, you know, seems slightly uh, counterproductive in some ways, though. You know, I mean, to not utilize all the potential growing time to produce as much material constantly. I mean, just from, you know, what we've seen, I mean, the continuous grow is by far the best way to produce, you know, staggering and staging. Yeah. You got a lot of work all at one time. Um, and then you're just dealing with, you know, management basically of that point, because it's so much in one shot, as opposed to like you were talking about spacing it out over the course of the year and staggering so that you have constant workflow for your workers, you know? Yeah. So, nor- so, so for the rest of the people on the call, so we, we know. Yeah, sorry. Work- I didn't mean to dominate. No, 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 it's no, let's, I, I just want to spell it out a little better for other people on the call is we normally work on, on what we call perpetual cycles we we right. tend to work in the in the in the terms of multiplier of four um if we can get four four rooms or four ways to grow um if you take eight weeks and break it up that means we yeah, harvest every two yeah. weeks and we right. just keep moving every two weeks and harvesting and we yep. turn five times a year five times five plus times a year right and so that's how an indoor perpetual grow kind of works right yeah we've worked on ones that do like you know uh double that basically eight weeks so every week you're kind of constantly pulling down one but same philosophy you know it allows it to just continue so yeah. um we do not see this we do not and that's why we kind of built this whole powerpoint presentation kind of at new york we did our best homework our team at griffin to think about what ways based on the laws and we're you know we want to listen to you guys as the customers of, you know, you're more in touch with the state of New York to feed us back information. The more information we get, we'll kind of go at it and try to take it apart even better and come up with better scenarios for you. But based on what we saw in the law and what we currently are reading, that's how we came to this conclusion and the direction we went. Okay. Yeah, because they just made a change to like our uh, sampling requirements, at like, I don't know, Wednesday, at like 11 o'clock at night. It was really weird. <laughs> and, and, and don't think you're being singled out. This has happened in every state that cannabis has ever moved to in a rec market. Sure. So regulations no. and stuff constantly change and they can go both directions, just so right. you know. You, no, you got to get, get your voice out there so they know which way, you know, that's, that's where we kind of need to work together to get. We've, those we've seen it go. Way. We've seen it go both ways. You got to remember, yeah. this is still not a federally regulated right. crop. It's still right. illegal. So, the state writes the rules. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, that was basically what they did is they changed it to where we had like uh, line testing procedures, you know, that would be similar with products and you could group products together. You know, now basically they're going to say each individual strain has to be independently tested so that, you know, your cost for cultivators is going to go up, you know, 10x, what would have been $3,000 to do groupings of plants together to get them tested for microbials and things like that. Now we have to do each strain that we grew individually. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a major change as far as the mm-hmm. cost. Of that part. Mm-hmm. But it's not going to affect the processors, just the cultivators. So that's kind of, you know, where you're talking about a single dollar. I know it doesn't seem like that, but sometimes it does. <laughs> I'll know it's uh, everything you're talking about is huge. And that's why we always talk about, you know, I can't stress that slide I had that the pre-planning side of all this, people tend to, we walk into a lot of situations where people have jumped. Okay. Just want to get in, just want to do it, want to plant the maximum amount. It may not be the best plant. You might want to your first year grow some in the ground, some in pots, some in a greenhouse. Yeah, See that's which exactly one what we works did. best. Yeah, used it to collect the data points for this year and then make the best assessment for the next grow. Because there's a lot of, uh, you know, strains that aren't going to do well in our climate and just environment in general. You know, uh, things that grow good out west or in the south, you know, uh, that I've been successful with before uh, struggled really bad last year. So. Um, those are key points, but I just want to thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate, you know, all the input and I'll uh, keep tabs on uh, what you guys are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, And don't forget, you can also follow us on Instagram and um, you can find us at Griffin underscore underscore cannabis on Instagram. 
Yeah, Mike Ryan's been a great help. Uh, he's been pivotal for us since the beginning. So uh, shout oh, out good. to him. Uh, you good. guys just, uh, keep doing what you're doing and expanding the information. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. I think so that's every I think that's it for um, questions. Um, people will get a copy of this presentation if you've attended. So you have Scott Baker's email. You have Peter Armando's information. If you have any additional questions, if you had a chance to digest the info a little bit, um, feel free to reach out. And don't forget, we do have other webinars coming up in the series. Yeah, there's, there's still three more webinars in the series, guys. Next, so please make sure you watch for that coming in the mail. Um, like I said, as this, we're going to build on this. Keep keep directing it towards specifically how you guys are growing in New York, and and so there could be some good debate in in the lighting one on on the model lights and stuff in the room. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you.